to hear all the value said like that. I, um, this is one of the first times that I'm talking around this subject um, today, so it's nice to do it and feel like I'm in good company. Uh, but yeah, my, I mean, my history really is, I started my first company, internet. It's always been internet and it's always been people. I started my first one when I was 19 with all my buddies at, in my hometown. I was lucky enough, we had about 20 of us together. I was lucky to sell it when I was 21. Paid off my mortgage, uh, built a log cabin in my garden, rented the house to friends. It's been a community house for 10, 15 years now, or 10, I don't know, 10, 12, probably, it's probably getting towards 15, to be honest. Um, that's been great. Um, and I just lived, I didn't, I didn't make, I made like 300 grand when I sold my company. So a decent chunk of cash, but not like a super millionaire. Mm-hmm. Just meant that I got to live very simply um, and um, ask broader questions. Uh, ended up building another company called Givey, which was a donation platform for charities, trying to change the way the world thinks about giving and make it a part of our everyday life. Um, and that was a big journey for five years or so for me, um, learning about how society works, the third sector, government, um, activists, everything in between. And, and then the last few years, it's been quite different. I've been kind of, I left business behind and, um, well, I left everything behind, the theology, the tools, the doctrine, everything I grew up with and started from scratch. So I don't know if that helps. Yes. That's a great indication. Thank you very much. Um, And just to those of you who are just joining us, if you could just help us out by putting your name, where you're joining us from, and the things that are drawing you to this conversation, that will really, really help us. Um, So my first question to you, Dave, um, I've got four questions and then we'll have a group discussion. My first question really is uh, um, focusing Uh, like digging in a little bit more to that part of your history where you did sell your business and then you decided to live off grid in a forest. Um, Can you just briefly tell me about that part of your life and what that taught you about reconciling with the earth? And did you consider that to be an act of peace at the time or have you since considered that to be an act of peace? Um. So two quite distinct chapters for me, really. Um, I grew up in a a sort of a community and climate of Christianity. I guess that's the first part. And so uh, sponged up a lot of values and different stuff through that. Then then that first 10 years was characterized really in, in, um, in, in doing, in the doingness, the fight, building, pushing my energy into the world. Um, and progressively asking different questions. To begin with, it was like, can I, well, the reason I started a company was so that I didn't have to have an alarm clock and be on somebody else's time. I just, I really hate alarm clocks. It's just a pet pet peeve I've got that I just hate them. I deeply hate them. Um, uh, So that was the first thing. And then the second thing was, you know, can I, can I kind of get a bit financially free? And then the next thing is, well, if I've learned these tools of business and technology and, my kind of philosophical position on technology is that it just amplifies the voice you put in it. So it can be good. It can be bad. So if it can be good, how can we bend the new technologies to be useful and helpful for human flourishing? But essentially all of that was an unfolding of uh, doing this. Um, Then when I left all that behind, um, well, it was as I was approaching 30, I had a bit of a, uh, a soul searching trip to Costa Rica. I went um, to the Corcovado rainforest, which is the most biologically diverse place on the planet, two and a half percent of the world's biodiversity in one canopy. And if you haven't been there, yeah, it, you can feel it. That's the point. Your senses are on fire. The, the tastes, uh, the smells, the colors, the sounds, everything's just it's on steroids. It's To be honest, for me, it's like a Mecca. It's kind of what I imagine um, heaven to be like. It's the fulfillment of um, life, really, um, or the best I've seen of it. And so I, when I came back from that and I let go there of all of my doctrine and theology and I, I sort of wanted to start from scratch, uh, I wanted to bring some of that back uh, into my life. And I had, I'd been living in the Silicon Valley for the year and learned a lot about 
technology and where we're headed with technology uh, with machine intelligence and beginning a blockchain journey and I've been doing some academic work for UCL University trying to understand so if we're going to talk about artificial intelligence we're talking about the fake version of something well what is the real what is the thing we're talking about what is intelligence and so I started to inquire into the nature of intelligence and um, did some interdisciplinary research there, which was interesting. So basically a very explorative time for me. But when I was considering what do I need to do with my life before I ask any extra questions, I realized that actually the only thing I really need to do is to be a good son. Uh, as my parents get old and um, pass on, I want to be present, easily be present. Um, and also I should probably have a crack at being a father at some point. But I thought, well, that second part can happen anywhere. The first part I could do with being near my parents. So um, I was lucky enough to connect with uh, a landowner in Sussex. And um, I explained that I wanted to find some space away from the busyness, the doingness. Um, and I wanted to start from scratch. And uh, so we agreed to do an experiment where I uh, got 25 acres of woodland initially for, for a year. And I, um, I bought a shepherd's hut off eBay and I, I wheeled it into the woods and just began trying to learn. And it's worth saying, and this is why I split the two worlds, I had never cooked, I had never cleaned, I had never really, uh, my lifestyle, what I'd been rewarded for was delegation and, and, and sort of like getting other people to do things. So I had never, I had missed a lot of what you get at university and by doing stuff yourself and by earning money young and delegating, I missed a lot of that. So it was really a baptism of fire by going uh, back to the woods for me. Yeah, that's amazing. And through that time of, of going back to basics and being um, in the woods and having to rely on yourself or rely on the resources around you, um, was there some major lessons that came out of that for you about the systems that we do rely on, on, on a daily basis. So energy systems, food systems, finance, your idea of community. Yeah. Speak into that. What, what you took away and learned about systems. I know that's a, yeah, a I mean, tiny question. Yeah, exactly. We could be here uh, for a long time talking about that. Um, and that's again, one of the things I love about the woods is there is time to discuss at length things that we're, there is never time for in, in the modern system. But, um, yes, to all of the above, everything got reformatted for me, even just really simple, very stupid concepts. You know, I, I thought, for example, I was going to get my shepherd's hut in there and I was going to make it all feel on grid very quickly. Um, you know, I thought I would be having a flushing loo because I thought, right, I'll be able to engineer this. You're bringing all your modern thinking in. And then slowly, you, we well, you just very simple thoughts like, OK, well, even if I can, how long is that waste pipe going to have to be to get from here out of the 25 acre woodland back to the mains? And then so basically bit by bit, drip by drip, everything just starts getting dismantled in my mind about how I think things will work. And then actually the solutions that I really need are just incredibly simple. And I guess on that practical level, I was shown how little we do need um, in terms of rainwater capture, composting toilets i didn't believe the guys on youtube that were like doesn't smell at all because they were looking super hippie like and i thought now nah, your standards of what smells and what doesn't is different to mine but when i finally did do the composting loo and have to uh, shovel my shit and put it in a in a hole as you have to face up to in the woods and that fully directly dealing with all your own stuff i was amazed it, it didn't smell at all it was one of the easier tasks i had to deal with in the woods but I think that's on a practical level, but on a kind of social level, I think one of the biggest things that I, that was a massive treat that I found, because I went to be alone and I didn't know what I'd find. I didn't really know if I'd come out the other side, honestly, but the support both from the local farmers and the locals, uh, you know, just in the local area and also online because um, I started making weekly YouTube videos that I shared on my YouTube channel and this kind of the willingness to support in my moment of vulnerability where essentially I was an idiot going into the woods knowing nothing was incredible and people started sending me stuff from around the world to the local pub that I'd go and pick up every now and again when I went for a pint um, 
knitting me socks and sending them in and I'd go and pick them up or, or like asking, where's your um, carbon monoxide detector? Like you're going to, you're going to kill yourself in there with carbon monoxide poisoning. And so from knowledge to artistic creativity, there was a huge um, level of support really. And I really, so it was a journey of like um, uh, sort of, unlearning a journey of embracing a sort of a, a deeper dependence on one another um and then obviously then especially i went in in the late autumn into the winter and then obviously especially when the spring started coming up and i was absolutely blown away by really seeing not just beautiful things for the first time but seeing the process of beautiful things emerging for the first time I'd never paid attention in that way to watch the difference as the bluebells, the enemas, the, the um, uh, you know, the, the wild garlic and um, even the foxgloves in the summer, all of these things coming through, seeing them change day by day was, it literally blew my mind. Um, so yeah, I think um, <laughs> like, yes, 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 all of the above completely reformatted my under standing of how dynamic this world really is when you get outside the game yeah okay and i love i love some of your I, I i will link in your your website and your youtube because some of your you know journey that you did capture on video is fascinating to watch um and i know that we're breathing through these questions so if you can take um, the, some of the things that you learned about those systems and fast forward and, and so let's start to root them into the present day. Um, so obviously we're in the middle of this um, pandemic mm -hmm. um, and obviously those that are most acutely affected are the people that have you know, contracted this illness, have died or lost loved ones because of it and the health workers that are on the front lines. Um, but in grinding our normal everyday lives to a halt, we are inadvertently all deeply affected by it, um, by, uh, affected by this. And there'll be people who, rightly so, are fully concerned with their health or their ability to make a living. And there are others that are watching daily life change, like there being no food in the supermarkets or, or their vacations being on pause and we're identifying, you know, key workers, who is and who isn't key workers, all, all those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And for those that have the capacity to start to like think about some of these things, some of us are thinking, hang on a second, like, is this current societal framework fit for purpose? Um, mm -hmm. Today I saw a picture of graffiti on the wall, I think in the States saying, Corona is the virus and it's capitalism is the pandemic. Mm -hmm. uh, you talked about your, on your latest blog about this being like a warning shot mm -hmm. for us um, in terms of just climate collapse. Um, ecological collapse. So, <laughs> bringing all of that, what are your thoughts on the coronavirus and the questions that it does raise for us? Mm. What are the opportunities that you believe there to be in this crisis? And what is it teaching us about how we have to adapt to our future ecological and societal breakdown? Well, we only deal with some small menial questions on these, uh, on these video calls, don't we? <laughs> Um, well, the last time we had decolonizing peace building, so I don't know, I think you, you might have this easier. <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> yeah, I think I do. Um, so, so, I mean, firstly, it's a, it's a sad and fascinating time that we're in. Um, and I did write a short blog the other day trying to find the, the connection between what we're experiencing with Corona and, uh, and what's going on with the climate. And, Put in very simple terms, it seems to me that this is a uh, a ten percent warning shot that the existential well, it's not really an existential risk to humanity this coronavirus it could take out five percent of us if we do it very poorly um, could be a lot less if we do it well, um, but it does ask us to uh, uh, forces us to ask some urgent questions also creates a bit of space to help us believe that we really can dramatically change how we operate very, very quickly if we have the willpower to do so. So there's some interesting things there. Um, but yeah, really, whether, whether you're looking at the severity of the, the risk level or whether you're looking at the timeline that we're dealing with, we, we've got one year to kind of get it right with the first wave of this corona stuff. Um, and we've got probably 10 years to get it right in terms of our carbon emissions um, to avoid and 
you know, something seri more serious happening or like an extinction level event in sort of 60 years time. Um, and that's what the climate scientists are, are saying to me. Um, and so I think that in amongst all of the uncertainty, there is significant opportunity for us here. And I think the thing that you, the word that you've mentioned both to me before this call and on this call now is, is the, the values and the focus around peace um, and looking for peace and peacemakers. And to be honest, that isn't language that I tend to directly uh, use uh, a lot. But um, it's been interesting for me to think about it because when I was uh, in the woods, you know, you have to, I, 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 well, let me start with this. I think that there's three ingredients for me that go into making a peaceful sort of society, let's say. Um, and the three words that came to me were um, diversity. So our kind of openness to embrace and to tolerate one another. Uh, which I think you'd be very familiar with in this community. The second is um, design. Um, so how do the systems we have um, sort of influence our behavior and daily rhythms? And the third is uh, just called digging, just for the sake of keeping the Ds, which is I love digging, elaboration. That, that piece that comes from inside, you know, that through the spiritual journey, through um, self-inquiry, uh, whatever your practice um, is, it's it's how do we find that inner peace? So it's a kind of like designing for peace, um, uh, embracing it philosophically, and sort of how we look at the world and diversity, um, diversity as as a operating philosophy, and then sort of that inner journey that leads to internal peace that then emits and radiates naturally from us. And and so I I was reminded of. Um, a philosopher called John Rawls, who you may be familiar with, whose thought experiment basically says, um, and to, well, to say really my interest, it, it's both um, in diversity, yes, and in the inner journey, yes, but probably what I spend my work time doing is in the design. So John Rawls' experiment starts with saying, well, if you were didn't know where in the world you were going to be born, what kind of world would you want to be born into? And I think that thought experiment leads you to try to design for um, fairness because uh, you want to give yourself a fair chance of a decent life if you don't know where you're going to be born, which is, a, I think, a very, very helpful starting point. And then... Uh, ...showed me something that I had lost um, but made sense post my experience in the woods, which is that we have a strong association, or at least I do, between the word fairness and the word justice. There's a strong sense that, you know, you want the justice system to be fair and for fairness to emerge, we need justice. But what I didn't realize was that the entomological roots of the word fairness are actually in the aesthetics. So it's actually in a beauty also has its roots uh, in, in, fairness so um or rather fairness apologies has its roots in beauty so actually beauty and justice are two sides of the same coin and um there are many of us that um you know so six months into the woods i'm having this delightful time frolicking around in the bluebells enjoying life blissfully becoming less and less aware of what's going on in the world around me but there was a sense that i couldn't have a fuller a more fuller human experience unless I also embraced the other side of the coin and figured how could I participate in bringing about justice to both the beauty and the justice then in my life hopefully leading uh, to a fairer world um, and so all of that to say around the diversity design and digging into yourself and then thinking about beauty and justice for me those are the ingredients that can lead to sort of a peaceful society, if you will, uh, one where we are able to uh, flourish um, or experience eudaimonia, I think Aristotle called it, that sort of sense of human flourishing. Um, but how, we, how the hell we go about actually doing that is another question altogether. Well, I know that it's a question that, you know, keeps you up 
at night and keeps you up a lot in the day. And um, I'm excited about what you're working on at the moment and what you're designing right now. And the little that I do understand of it, because, you know, Dave, you do have a quite a unique and brilliant mind. <laughs> and I don't always understand the concepts that you're talking about. But, and we don't have the time to really get into it here. But you talk about the fact um, that you believe the solutions or some solutions for us do does lie in the brave in innovative ideas that increase our awareness of how we relate to technology and you talk about many of your ideas coming from the wisdom of ecology so i just wondered if you could just give us kind of like a a little snippet here about the types of things that you are working on and what you what you are designing and then i'm going to pass it over to the group and we're going to get some questions and answers and discussions in here yeah well, and that's the bit I can't wait to hear is yeah. I can see faces from all over the place in this call and I want to hear what stuff uh, you're interested in and, and know about and have that kind of exchange. But I think firstly it is to say that although I went into the woods on my own, it very quickly became a community both locally and globally. So kind of hyper local in the woods and globally across the internet. And we've more fully expressed that now. We've been on tours, we've had events in Australia and America and in chateaus and distilleries and all kinds of weird and wonderful places all around Europe as well. And it is out of that kind of community outside of the market, that kind of renaissance long-term thinking of getting different minds together that these ideas have emerged. And so I think the first thing to say is that anything I share, I may be a mouthpiece, but it's certainly not my idea. Um, it is something that has bubbled up because of a diverse group of voices that, that again, creates that culture for bravery. And I, I, do, I do believe that anybody who takes an inner, inner journey seriously, who takes spirituality seriously in any kind of format, the, the fruit of that journey in one way or another has to be bravery. And it can come in a million different formats. But if, you, if I can't see or you can't show where you take some kind of risk or take some kind of um, some kind of expression that comes from inside that leads you to do something slightly different, then I have to question uh, what that path is leading you towards. Because for me, it's a natural outworking of that inner, uh, inner strength and inner peace, I guess. But um, so we're all fumbling along trying to find our own ways to do that. Um, that's the context. Um, the, si the simple, I mean, the quickest way I guess I could say what I've been working on is how do you, <laughs> I mean, how do we survive? That's the first question um, in, in this world that we're faced with, with the challenges of environmental crisis, how we relate to AI and the future of technology and how we deal with this refugee crisis and how all of those three relate. And I've ended up on this idea of, of thinking about what if we were able to invent a new, a new kind of money, a new kind of currency that was tree backed instead of gold backed or backed by nothing as the fiat currencies like the UK pound or the US dollar uh, are or like cryptocurrencies that fluctuate like crazy. But what if we actually rooted our trade in real world? Because the and so I'll go on to explain the idea before I sort of like complicate it too much because I certainly don't want to lose you guys. Um, so we've been devising um, this cryptocurrency that is backed by trees. So you, every coin you buy is represented by a real new tree that gets planted in the ground that um, is then a carbon capturing machine. That's what trees are so fruit and they provide habitat for biodiversity and they improve soil quality but they also capture carbon every single day that it's doing the reverse of breathing it is um, capturing carbon and helping us not to cook ourselves um, and so that's the idea is that we can actually incentivize the planting of new forests through turning them essentially into a form of currency and I hope by doing that that you know, at the moment, GDP and all our metrics around money are flawed because they they just know they have no vision for the fact that we're in a constrained biology, that we have one world that has finite resources, 
and therefore will never, never truly satisfy because there's just no, nothing in the design of our existing financial framework that needs to take account of biology. And therefore, you've always got the world's pulling in different directions. So my feeling is, if you impregnate your financial system with the biological constraints and risks from its inception, surely then it has no choice but to grow in a more woven together fashion. And so, yeah, we haven't got it figured out. Uh, but this is my risk, do you know what I mean? This is my uh, attempting to do it. And we planted our first thousand trees, sold the first thousand coins, um, but they're being minted, if you will, at the moment. We're probably two weeks, one to two weeks away from being able to launch the first currency. And so I know I'm on a big rampage here, but the final thing to say is that um, I've been really inspired by um, the Brixton Pound project when I saw the TEDx talk of that a couple of years ago. Um, because in a way, what I'm describing here in one way is a, sort of, in a way, a kind of a, a global village form of a local currency for the community that I'm in, this Corcovado community. Um, and uh, yeah, so definitely worth checking out the TEDx talk of the Brixton Pound to understand the value of small currencies to build relationship, especially in this time of sort of apparent disconnection. We have to find, like the Zoom call, we have to find different tools and ways of knitting ourselves more deeply together uh, in ways that don't uh, sacrifice our planet in the process. Fascinating, totally amazing. Um, Thank you so much for sharing that. And I know that you, like you said, you're in the, you're, this is the, you're on this journey and you're, you're stepping out you're being brave. You're taking risks on it. Um, and I know that that's something that we, that I'm going to be following you along and I would love to get you in again, you know, whether physically if we're allowed, when we're allowed to, or virtually, um, to talk to us more about that journey that you go on through mm. the launching of this new initiative. Um, but right now, I would love to open up the conversation a little bit wider. And I, if you see in, in the chat box, um, yes. people have written like where, you know, where they're coming from and what their interest level is on this. So I would just love to open it up to people. Uh, it doesn't have to be a question for Dave, but it can be. Um, it can be something that you want to share that you've come across mm -hmm. about um, on, on this subject. So I'm just going to unmute people. And if you do share, you will be recorded. And if you do share. Any questions for Dave or comments? Oh. Can you remind us of those three D's again? I wrote them down. Diversity. Design, yeah, diversity, uh, design. And digging. And, and digging. There is, yeah. had to stick with the D theme. I love it. I love alliteration too. Um, so any, uh, Caroline, I saw that you wrote an, a question in there or, and if anyone else has a question that you want to throw in or a comment about what people have been exploring. Yeah, I was just interested because obviously current economic models don't, are not inclusive, not accessible. Um, that's why we have to say, well, this it comes back to the economic models i was just wondering how we go forward after this and become more inclusive and more accessible so that all, all different groups of people would not have a but don't have a predominant model which excludes them really that was my my interest i mean that's a that is a great question and for my part at least the reason that i make the point about this idea comes out of community is for the exact reason you're illustrating now. Like, I haven't yet thought about what you're asking. And the only way, for example, take just take my, my idea as the example here, there are lots of ideas coming out of lots of communities that are, that are good answers to the problems we face. But like, my ability to flex this project in the direction you're talking would be through conversation with you. Mm. would be through extending this conversation longer than we have time for now and through bringing your mind to it we would bring that kind of strength to the project i 
I do not have the capacity. I, I haven't got the lived experience or currently until we're talking now, the kind of mind associated with the project that cares about the, the direction you're talking about. But it sounds very important and you know, I would love to just talk. Mm. Yeah. yeah, definitely happy to talk more. Mm. Great. Thanks, Caroline. Are people, what are, for, and, and let me phrase it in a different way. What is this current crisis causing people? What questions are people asking of the current systems that we have? What, where have you seen things become vulnerable that maybe you hadn't noticed before? Can I just say, so? I was, was so surprised that um, it was toilet roll, but it seemed to be the thing that everyone was kind of clamoring for. Yeah. So I found that really unexpected and it's kind of made me think like, you know, maybe you know, how we imagine that things could be playing out in the next decades, it might actually look completely different and, and sort of unexpected. Yes. Definitely. Totally. So curious why that was the first thing to go. Mm. I think that there's, um, there's always a, a, so to take some of these sort of spiritual concepts and make them practical, I think we always have a choice in any scenario to be a consumer or a creator. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so, you know, I've been asking myself the question, would love to hear any examples in this group about, you know, when it comes to the toilet roll, the food stuff, how can I participate at least in part in the, in the creative story around food? How can I participate in part in the creative story around energy and water provision, not just be on the consumer side of it? And I'm, I'm personally inspired and, and uh, excited by hearing different stories around how people have moved themselves to the other side of the dial of creating toilet paper. I mean, not that I've heard any stories about that yet, but. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. And interestingly enough, the um, St. Ethelberger's does work around what we have titled um, Deep Adaptation. Mm -hmm. And it's based on the work of the scientist Jem Bendel. And we started in some of our retreats taking people through these scenarios of what happens when, and, and we were actually framing it in what happens because of Brexit. So we were saying what happens after Brexit goes through and we're in the supermarket and we're not used to the supply chain that we've been used to in the past. How are we going to handle that moment when we walk into a supermarket and we are not faced with what we usually see? Um, never thinking that it would happen this quickly, <laughs> but this is, this is about what you said, um, Dave, about us doing that internal peacemaking work of like, how are we going to respond in these crises? Are we gonna be the people that are fighting over things in a supermarket or how are we preparing ourselves? So it's really interesting that you raise that because this is work that St. Ethelbergers has been doing around deep adaptation. Mm. Yeah, I love that, how we can be creators, not consumers. Mm. Anyone else who, um, who this has raised questions for, or questions that you wanna to pose to the group or for Dave or comments? Uh, can I have a question, please? Yes. Uh, this is, okay, this is uh, Wes, Somerset, UK. Yes, hi, uh, I'm just yeah. hi. Um, so obviously, we talk about the new economy quite a lot, but it's based on new economy, and people got up the next day and went to their jobs. You know, Dave the plumber still is Dave the plumber. Mm -hmm. You know, so what changes for people? Is is for a question, perhaps a wider question about what a a different society might look like as well. Mm -hmm. Well, I think so. I mean, ask yourself. What is an economy? Um, economy is really just an extension of how do we relate to one another? How do we exchange and survive ourselves? So in a way, I don't spend a lot of time thinking directly about economy. I just consider what, how do I want to be with the people around me? How do I want to engage with the things that survive me and my household and those around me? And um, so I think that if you look at the world and society through a relational lens of how do we want to be together, and that leads you back to the creator consumer sort of trying to find some balance there. Um, but also, I guess it's accepting that 
it is deeply, and I'm proud to believe that it's deeply within our human nature for us to be dependent. Um, it's, it's a deep design feature of being a human being that we're dependent. The question is just what do we want to be dependent on or whom do we want to be dependent on? Who or whom? I'm not sure which one it is. Um, and, and how do we want to be in that dependence? And, and so for me, at least, the way my brain works, I can think about more complex, more abstract systems, but only through the lens of thinking about it as a primary relationship first and thinking about the power dynamics and the, uh, who wins out of that relationship. And just like you would with a marriage or a you know, relationship with your father or you know, a child and that kind of intimate relationship. And from there, I extrapolate out. And um, so I guess the question is, to relate back to you know your, your that term of new economy, I guess my question would be well, how do you describe your old relationship with trade, with the world, with others, and what would you like your new relationship to feel like, to look like, and then the rest for me is an outworking of that fundamental uh, perspective, perception, and um, relationship. Really, don't know if that makes any sense. Yeah. It really does. Really, really good question for us all to think about. Um, Jacob has right, asked down here, how will people see the reality of cryptocurrency on a, on a local level? Jacob, I don't know if you want to expand on that or if it's... Uh, I was just saying it. Hear me? Yeah. Yeah, it was just based on um, noticing that maybe this whole pandemic might make sort of supply chains go more local or focus more locally which obviously if there's some sort of cryptocurrency in operation then people need to um see sort of see the benefits of it see the trees perhaps if, if they're going to really buy into using some new currency unless i've got the whole currency thing wrong um great question I'm not sure, I, could, would you mind trying again? I just want to make sure I've definitely got your question. So, based on my understanding of just your currency, mm -hmm. if it's to become this mass sort of used currency and it's supposed to form interdependencies between people, mm -hmm. then people obviously have to trust in it and they have to understand it. Mm -hmm. um, and sort of understand the ethos behind it, what you're trying to achieve with it, and therefore they need to see that taking place. And mm -hmm. I think, does that not need to happen on a local scale, mm -hmm. um, just based on the fact maybe localization might become more of a mm. more of an issue following this pandemic? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm with you now. Thank you. Um, I think so. There's so I totally agree around any kind of financial instrument any kind of concept frankly needs to be demonstrated well to build trustworthiness and for people to understand it um, definitely I think that um, the sort of operating philosophy for me since coming out of the woods has been about a both and lifestyle so it's a, for me human flourishing occurs with um, sort of when we can appreciate the fight and the flow the body and mind the city and country the on and off grid and um so the thing that was exciting for me originally about moving that it's been a very long three-year journey that's led me and and the community to this uh, concept with the tree coin or the corco coin but the fundamental thing that i liked was that the the forest the way that a, a forest has its interdependencies and it's interwoven with the mycelia, with it, how it trades carbon and, and uh, sends stuff between the different organisms, that sort of interconnectedness, it's, it's basically a decentralized system. If you go in and chop down one tree in the woods, you don't dismantle the whole forest. You just slightly weaken it, but it can reform, it can support itself and it can regrow. In the same way, that's how the structure of blockchain works. And, and I knew there was some symmetry between those two systems, despite them being well, and I particularly loved it because they were 
both um, digital and analog. And I really love where we bring those relationships together. So, so yes, it's about building connections with individuals within the community. And if you watch that Brixton Pound talk, you'll get what I'm saying around that. And it's about building a stronger connection between the digital and analog parts of our lives, which are undoubtedly, and we can see it even in this call, are an important part of our lifestyles going forward. The second part, when you talk about, should it be local first? Uh, it, it, that's an interesting question because local, what does local really mean? We meaning that the fundamental principle there is small scale um, and, and high levels of relationship and at small scale. Well, if you come from the body perspective, then yes, that would naturally lead you to a small geography. But the world I've been in, where I've been in the woods and built this community, is, it is small scale and it is local, but not geographically local. It's local in that I've collected this sort of hundred people, let's say, around the world that we formed a little bit of a feeling of a village, a shared mind, a shared culture, a shared understanding, some similar habits, some similar goals. Um, so it feels local, but it's not geographically based. I would say it's a community of mind because we're not a community of body firstly we're a community of mind first and then now figuring out differently how to work that and manifest that out into the body of our lives um so so to wrap that up i would say that yes we need to demonstrate more and yes it needs to start small which it is because that's the nature of the where we're at thousand trees thousand coins hundred or so people um but yes, not necessarily geographically small. I think that is a, that's a biological worldview um, and it's not the only one on offer. Yeah, thanks. Thanks Dave, thanks, thanks for that Jacob, really good question. Yes, Ian. Oh, let me, sorry, thanks. sorry, <laughs> go for it. Um, thanks, yeah, so, um, yeah, so I guess one of the things that's sort of um, been really sort of come into focus for me a lot during this pandemic is the inequalities in society, like in terms of people you know, having the resources to isolate or all this kind of stuff. And, um, and I know you folk care about fairness. Mm. Um, so I suppose my question is, what do you think, or what, what do you see as the, um, the kind of role of... Um, people in society who have more uh, like economic freedom or financial mm -hmm. resources. Um, yeah, what do you think is the role of those sorts of people um, in, in bringing this fairer, more just world into being? And um, how might they differ from people in different, different positions? Yeah, that is a bloody good question. Yeah. Um, and so I think, so I think there, there needs to be a significant critique of the market at large. So, for example, if you have um, ability to earn more than you need, there's a significant argument for, for not spending all of that extra time earning money. There's a significant argument for, let's say you can earn what you need in half your time, half your working time not half your sleeping and rec recreational and spiritual time, but half your working time in 20 hours a week, let's say, to spend the other 20 hours working for the market because you think that you're gonna give that money away and that's the most valuable thing you can do, that there is a significant critique that that may not be your most valuable contribution because the market, as soon as you enter into the game of the world, the modern world, as soon as you enter back into the game of the market, um, you are subject to the constraints of that market. So it's primarily very short-term thinking. The market cannot think more than five years ahead. At the moment, it cannot think more than a week ahead because it's absolutely being flipped upside down. So by your active choice to spend any time above what you need just to survive um, in the market, you're choosing to let yourself be somewhat pressurized to constrain your thinking to very short time periods going back to the castle and the the time that we've spent together in that sort of feeling of renaissance that feeling of rebirth comes from a relationship between 
space, landowners and creatives, getting outside of the market and being able to think long term about society. And right now, and there's a significant value in society for having some people thinking and creating bravely from a long term perspective, thinking, let's talk, let's just talk 30 to 60 years rather than three to six years, let's say. And if we look to the environment we're in right now with Corona, this is more acutely present than three months ago, where the, the analogy I would use is that we're all in desperate need of ventilators, but the human in question also is suffering from stage one cancer. So that cancer still needs treatment, still needs radiotherapy, still needs care and attention, whilst we're also providing the ventilator because we're dealing with an acute problem over the next three months to 18 months. And so if you think of the body of society, the mind body of society as that human that is under two different pressures, the kind of longer term early stage cancer onset, which is the trajectory that the climate scientists tell me that we're on, um, versus the corona, COVID ventilator shortage, we can't lose sight of both. So to bring it back to land in what you're asking, those that have extra time, let's call it, because it's time before it's money, right? It's time first. If you have extra time, um, it is worth asking the question, would my contribution be richer and of greater service if I subject myself to the conditions of the market or choose to operate with this time outside it? and through community and friendship and and what would be a value to the mind body in this time and i don't there's no right answer it all comes down to who we are where we operate and and what excites us frankly i know for myself um i like to keep a balance i try to work no more than two days a week for the market um, i have a company now called our carbon it does uh, carbon auditing for small businesses but there's only a very finite bandwidth in which I can talk and operate. I can't have these conversations in that context. It's extremely limiting and very short-term thinking. It's still good work and it helps me pay my bills, but I don't like subjecting all of my time to that constraint. I feel I can have a richer contribution by preserving a decent chunk of my time each week to think in these sort of higher risk, longer term formats and make time to do things like this call and discuss with you guys and answer answer this question right now. Um, so I think the question I'd leave anybody who has fat on the bone, should we say, is for immediately stepping into trading your time for money, consider could there be a richer contribution if you got together digitally or, it, well, digitally at the moment, with a couple of pals who also have time and think about what other kind of outside of the market contribution is possible to be made. Okay. Thanks, Ian. Yeah, great. Thanks, David. And we've got, there's two questions in the chat. Um, and I don't know if anyone else wants to write their question because we've got just a couple of more minutes before we wrap up. Mm. Um, but two really good questions kind of for you to leave us with. Natasha has one about other examples other than the Brixton Pound that we could look at. And do you think the ideal economy has already existed? Natasha, did you want to expand on that anymore or? No, that's fine. And yeah. also uh, follows on really nicely to Imogen's question. So yeah. That's, yeah. Yeah, exactly. About long term, what your vision would be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, out of interest, quickly, are these questions lost at the end of the stream or do they get, do they stay? No. Yeah, I'm going to save them. Awesome. Okay, great. Because it is something that we could, if you had links or things that you want to signpost people to. Yeah. Including your I'm... own work and other things, and I can send people that. Definitely, definitely. I would like to to uh, substantiate some of these claims with some actual decent. <laughs> um, so, a good question about different forms of economy that are interesting. Um, I, I don't think I've got a good answer for you right now. I'm sure there's plenty, but nothing's popping to mind that makes me excited. Um, to share in this context. I'm yeah. sure there's plenty, but can I come back? With totally. Um, um, and then, which leads on to, is there a, a vision for how we would trans, trans, transition the whole economy into a bio-designed economic system? What would it look like and how would we get there? Um, 
just to relate it back to Jacob earlier, where he was asking about how would you get, you know, what needs to happen in terms of demonstrating these kinds of tools and um, how do you get it to scale and get people to trust it and understand it. I think there's something to be said again about the, the both and that mm -hmm. art and science are part of the same story. And for me, the role of good art is to expand and open up and the role of good science and technology is to, to fo close down focus and, and deliver. Um, so baked within this um, financial expression that I'm talking about of this tree-based currency, I initially see it as art. I see it as providing a service and an opening up service. And it may move to the science uh, chapter where it actually becomes structurally useful. But at the moment where we're at with a thousand trees and a hundred coin holders and you know just the early stages it for me it is art and it's providing hopefully and for the purposes of this conversation i hope that ideas like this one can inspire imaginations i loved what you said earlier as, as well becca the, the the discipline of imagination i think yeah. what yeah. a wonderful rigorous way to think about an opening up space which i've never heard before so I basically hope that you guys will come up with better ideas than we come up with for how to forge a relationship between uh, machine and biology, between the financial systems and the constraints of the the, the body of the world that we live in. Um, and so I would say that a vision of that, how we get there is only in it's only ever through a movement of lots of different projects and people and therefore these communications are vital to share learnings failures to be honest are the cheapest things to share because that helps other people to avoid making them themselves um and it's just a, a thousand a thousand projects headed with the similar direction of trying to not throw things away but rather work harder at, moot and at bringing them together. I think that tends to be what excites me, where people don't throw away the financial system or throw away technology. But I'm actually reading a great book right now, uh, Wendell Berry's Why I'm Not Gonna Buy a Computer. And it's a lovely little essay he wrote and, um, uh, and then people's responses and his response to that. But this sort of critique, but not throwing away and wrestling with that is, is, is sort of where I live and what I love. Um, so I think it would be reductive and wrong of me to give a simple answer to that question because I think it would do a disservice to the thousands of other people and voices and projects that go into finding the one or two that you kind of remember. This tree coin we're doing could be a painting that's on your wall that helps to inspire you to build something that's more structurally useful or it could be structurally useful in its own right. I, time will tell but what i would say is if you fancy buying one tree just for educational purposes then do it and then you'll know more about it by trying it yourself and um you can always uh, drop me a line if you're interested in that but I'm keen to hear your thoughts yeah i love that um we're, we're gonna wrap up here in, in the next minute if anyone does have any last burning questions um, please do enter them into the chat box and I can save that and then we can forward the questions on to Dave and then when I send out the recording of of this webinar to you then I can include those in there from him. Um, Dave I'm really really grateful did you did you want to say any last words Dave? Only only that I would be I really I we didn't have the time today but I would be very pleased if anybody was interested to to do a session of a similar length um, explicitly covering three subjects, which is the history of money, mm -hmm. why we have it, where it came from, how carbon works, um, and why it's of interest in this time, um, and how blockchain works and why it's of interest in this time. Because I think ultimately for the concept I'm talking to you about, uh, there's only so far you can go on it unless you have a grasp of those three things. Um, and um, you know, could take 10 minutes to explain each one with 10 minute discussion after each one. And that could be quite a rich thing if anybody was interested. Yeah, definitely. And I, I, I'd love to explore those possibilities um, with you. And I think 
that was that was all that you and I had already had that conversation about doing that. And then with the coronavirus, we recognized that there's so much that's being, you know, broader questions that are being thrown up for us. And so it was really, really great to bring in that wider perspective. And I would love to dive into those specifics with you some other time um, in the next few months for sure. And it's great that people are saying yes to that as well. Um, Dave, I'm really, really grateful. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you to everyone as well for joining us, for taking the time out from those people that are, you know, in this world to those that, you know, are stuck at home and have nothing else to do. Like everyone was welcome here and I'm so glad that you joined us. I will send out the recording to you. You can forward it to whoever you like. Um, and I just want to give you an encouragement that we are, uh, we've got lots of events happening online at the moment as, as to everybody else. And um, tomorrow and Friday, we are doing a little bit more of the contemplative conversations. Tomorrow, our chaplain, Dave Tomlinson, is hosting a soul space from 1230 to 130. And on Friday, I will be hosting um, a meditation and conversation. And this is just to kind of stop and connect and address how we're feeling, how communities are feeling in the midst of this pandemic. Dave, thank you again so much. Thank you to everyone. I'm going to open up to gallery of you just to see everyone's beautiful faces. Thank you to everyone for joining us. Blessings to you all, Dave. Thank you so much. Thank you guys so much. Really great. Have a great afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.